Good day, everyone. My name is John Hordisky, and welcome to the panel of the rise of AI in the dam space, leveraging the opportunities machine learning provides. I'm very excited to be here today with uh, the Festival of the Dam to be on this panel with my esteemed dam uh, metadata and AI colleagues, Anthony, Jill, Christina, and Hooten. We've got about 45 minutes for this panel. Uh, which will include a healthy Q&A section from yourself. So make sure when you're uh, watching and listening to use your panel to go and start asking some questions. I'll be watching those. And without further ado, I would love for each panelist to say hello and to introduce themselves. So over to Anthony. Oh, sorry, I go first. It's me, sorry, I go first. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the next slide, please. as it switches over. This is the very slow, groovy one. I love it. My name is John Hordisky, uh, Managing Director of Salt Flats. I've been doing consulting with our firm for digital asset management, metadata, taxonomy, governance, all those amazing things for over 20 years now. Uh, fortunate enough to have worked with clients from a multitude of industries. Uh, uh, I'm also an adjunct faculty at San Jose State University, where I teach a graduate course in digital asset management. Uh, do a lot of conference speaking. Pleas pleased to have worked with the Henry Stewart organization for over 15 years now. Uh, had a few a book a few years ago. I have a new book on metadata coming out in November. And now I will pass it to my esteemed colleague, Anthony, to introduce himself. Over to you, Anthony. Thank you very much, uh, John. I, my video isn't working there. I wonder if I think someone else is controlling my. There we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending the session today. My name is Anthony Gallo. I'm the Chief Product Officer at uh, Tenevis Corporation, which is a, a new modern uh, data center centric dam that's in the marketplace today. And I'm proud to represent that team and the technologies that go with it. We're deep into AI and love the topic and the space. So excited to talk about it with you here today. Uh, my background is basically 25 years in the space, have innovated digital technologies and sold them to corporations, eventually taking on uh, executive roles, uh, running R&D and product for customer experience management platforms in my background and also big data capabilities. So uh, lovely to be here with everybody on the panel today. So excited to do this. Thank you. Over to Jill. Yeah, hi, I'm Jill Golden. I should probably change the slide, pardon me. Um, I'm the director of the Historical Life brand at the Meredith Corporation. Um, so we manage over 10 million digital assets, um, original negatives, prints and film uh, from the Life Magazine uh, collection. I have a, a master's in library science from Syracuse and a master's in the humanities from Stanford. Uh, previously to Meredith, I was working as a librarian and an archivist at places like NYU, the US government, the Wilson Center, um, and so on. Excited to learn all about what you guys are doing today. Thank you, Jill. Over to Christina. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christina. I'm an independent dam consultant and I've been in the dam industry coming up on nine years now. Um, and unlike Jill, I didn't really get into this industry on the straight and narrow path. So you can see here, um, I'm actually a trained ecologist and geographer, um, but I did get some skills there that are useful now in the dam industry for data management and governance. Um, and also I've moved around the world. So I've moved from the US to Switzerland and then a little pot, plot twist happened um, about 10 years ago now and I moved to the UK. And that's when I joined this amazing dam community and started um, uh, joining in the Henry Stewart uh, community, which is an amazing group. So thank you all for being here. Um, these are some of the services that I offer to my clients, uh, selection and implementation, um, optimization and change management. And some of the most exciting work I'm doing right now is getting back into um, giving back to the DAM community by sharing the knowledge and experiences that I've learned along the way that I wish someone had taught me uh, nine, 10 years ago when I got into this industry. Um, so I'm doing a course 
in uh, early next year with Henry Stewart on change management and user adoption. So if anybody, any, anybody here is interested in that, please come and join me. Um, and I'm also part of the Rutgers uh, Professional DAM Certificate Program. Thank you, Christina. And over to Hooten. Good afternoon, good evening to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hooten Soyelzad, uh, co-founder and business development officer of QBank DAM, based out of Stockholm, Sweden. And um, yeah, my background is as a developer. So I uh, started developing my first DAM tool already uh, 19 years ago. And um, yeah, I've been involved in implementation of over 200 different DAM solutions for um, large enterprises, small companies within different sectors. Um, happy to be part of this panel. Thank you, Hooten. Okay, uh, this is what we did. We met as a team virtually on email and all other forms of communication to review some questions that we wanted to run through. Uh, again, this is sort of a sort of a roundtable panel type presentation. So we have five topics. Uh, we're going to go through them all as you hear and listen and see and understand some of the things we're saying. Again, please feel free to use the, Q, uh, the question functionality. I'll be moderating those. Uh, we prefer to answer the questions at the end, but if there's something pertinent to something we have, one of us may have said, we will definitely address it as we can. Uh, so without further ado, here we go to the best panel of the day, the rise of AI in the damn space. All right, you know everyone on the attending right now uh, from their living rooms, from their patios, from wherever they are saying, okay, artificial intelligence. Sounds cool, heard about it, sounds like science fiction. It's kind of fiction now because it's actually happening to us. But how in the heck do you even get started? Uh, what do you do? What are those first steps? And I'm going to uh, uh, initiate this with uh, Jill. How do you get started? What are you doing? How did you do it? Are you still doing it? Uh, how did you get started? How does one get started with AI? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll speak about in my current role. So basically, it's to define a problem that you think uh, because of its scale or its complexity, you might need a tool that's not currently in your disposal um, that you can call upon. So in, our, in my current role, basically, we have over 10 million uh, digitized assets from analog film and manuscripts and 80 years worth of, of uh, non-standardized metadata. So being able to find photographs for clients such as filmmakers, designers, um, artists uh, was really difficult because you would have to keyword match between what era the metadata was written in and what the client is looking for today. So oftentimes I felt like search was a sort of text exercise, even though what I'm searching for is visual. So um, basically there are lots of fun tools you can experiment with out there. So uh, I started kind of doing a survey of the landscape uh, reached out to different vendors, uh, did experiments. Um, one of the things that I found most useful um, after defining my problem, of course, was understanding what the AI of these different vendors was trained on and see if that would be helpful for my particular use case. Um, just because we have, for example, historic photography. So a deep learning algorithm that's trained on current social media posts might not be as helpful, you know, as one that's trained on different data. So. That's kind of how I got started, but curious to hear yeah. about everyone else. Yeah, uh, who else on the panel would like to respond to that? Because there's different ways one can start their right. AI. Anthony, how, what's, what do you for some good thoughts on getting started with AI? Yeah, it's such an important question. I mean, where do you start? I mean, it's the big question. It's, it's, there's so much data science out there. I mean, if you try to research this and go it online, there's just so much to consume and it gets very confusing very quickly. And everything's moving so fast. I mean, the new advancements that are coming out. I mean, I remember five years ago, they were questioning whether some of these um, sort of image recognition tools were trainable. Now they're fully trainable and we can dig in and do that. So I think the first thing for me is to step back and really consider the team. I mean, I don't like the idea that AI is a black box that's sort of mystical and magic and magic happens. I think 
you know, bring in a team member, maybe bring in a data scientist to your team and start to kind of incorporate this thinking right into the team. And really, I, I believe that it's AI plus people. And I think that makes magic happen. So I think I'd really consider that as you're thinking of um, implementing AI, don't take it lightly, do your research, but maybe augment your team with some skills so that you really can kind of uh, bring it to its best effect as it, as it rolls out in your organization. Uh, we always say the triumvirate of people, process, technology. AI is somewhat technology, and you definitely need some people in process to get that uh, the robots working. Uh, Christina, how do you feel about getting started? Or what are some things that you've seen where people were able to get started with AI? Yeah, I want to echo what Jill said, um, which is start with the problem, not with the solution. And I heard Mike say this in the keynote this morning, and that was great because he said, there are so many solutions out there looking for a problem and actually we need to flip that on its head right so start with the problem first identify what what your business is trying to accomplish uh, what are your business objectives and where are the pain points and then think about um, whether it's it, john like you said people process or technology that can help to solve that and it's not always going to be technology it might be there's a, you know, there's a kink in the process and we need to work on that. So, um, so I think it's, it's definitely worth starting with the problem, think about the requirements and the use cases, and then understand if there is um, a potential solution out there. It might be AI, it might be some other piece of technology. Hooten, how are you seeing some people get started with AI? Um, I agree with, with uh, all of my fellow Analysts, um, so I think it's it's all about finding your your problems and defining your priorities and uh, finding which processes you can automate automate uh, or uh, get help from from your AI. Um, so it might be around asset creation, tagging, distribution of assets, uh, managing campaigns, and so on. So you need to look for those opportunities and um, then it's it's all about having uh, enough maturity level in your in your team to start with that. I think that's very important to that everybody's uh, on the same level and uh, having the right team with data scientists and so on. And um, it's it's very important to understand that um, the scientists have, might have different approach to things uh, rather than the application developers. So it's it's very, the communication there is, is very important, I think, making sure that, um, yeah, it, it needs to be clear requirements and uh, principles on, on what you want to achieve. Otherwise it can go, yeah, sorry. It can go back, it can go a different way. Yeah. And for some people, it, for some people uh, who are watching and listening today, it could be as simple as uh, like if Christina was saying, and Jill was referring to in terms of like, what's your, pro what's the problem? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, what are you trying to do? But you may even have to start thinking about the plan to do this. Do I have a budget for this? Uh, does my damn provider even do AI? Uh, does my damn provider know what, yeah, how experienced are there? There's so many good questions to ask. And I, I can see by the flurry of questions coming on the Q&A thing right now, there's a lot of people going, yeah, how do I do that? So for those of you who have damn providers, go talk to your product manager, your salesperson. For those of you who don't, go find one. Uh, there are many great individuals and organizations that are here a part of the festival. And go start asking those good questions to them because you do need to start. It's no longer science fiction. It is happening. Uh, but just make sure you start with some really good first steps, which the panel has definitely uh, brought to the discussion here. Okay, so you're starting, you know about it. Some people are thinking we've got some money, we've got some time to do this. It's going to happen in 2022. So uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So ML stands for machine learning. That's when the robots are doing their happy things in the background. Uh, how do you get the two to work? Like, is it just like, you know, we heard the words magic sometimes today in a few panels. It can be magical, but it's not necessarily magic. So, you know, how do you get the two together and start doing things? Uh, Anthony, how is how does this whole thing work with the dam? Tell us how it works. 
Well, this might sound a bit selfish, but I think you got to start by picking the right dam. I mean, um, today, not all dams are made equal. And I think a data oriented dam, a dam that thinks of this, this information and the sources as a first principle, a first order concept, not a passive thing, not something that sits in the background and sort of automatically adds these tags to metadata, but something that presents the concept that something in the background is working for you. So at Tenevis, we've taken a, a lot of time to focus on how do we render that AI capability into the UX and UI and the administrative tools and the configurability of the system and ensuring that it's dynamic, that it's constantly being updated. I mean, sometimes it's kind of like when you ingest a file, you might add some of these great tags using this AI engine and it kind of gets left and then we don't revisit that. And maybe the training didn't take hold properly. So I think it has to be normalized into the dam as an activity and a behavior and a capability that is as normal as managing your metadata. Christina, what are you seeing right now? How are people uh, seeing how AI machine learning are working well with their dam? Have you seen some things happen? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're lucky enough, then you, like Anthony said, you, you do have an, a dam that already has some of this integrated into it, but I don't think that's uh, the case across the board, right? So um, something I've seen companies do is go out and find the AI tools separate to their dam that they want and, and then use the modern APIs to connect the two. Um, and sometimes you can even just uh, point the AI directly at your, um, your cloud storage, or if you're lucky enough, again, depending on the system you're using, but you can even point it at an on-prem um, storage bucket and, and say, okay, I want to train this uh, machine learning algorithm on my data and here it, here's the data and you can present that directly. Um, how to do that? That's magic. <laughs> There's always a little bit of magic to be here from these kind of, I love that. There is some magic happening. Putin, have you seen some of the magic happen? You must see some people getting the machine learning, the AI to work. Uh, what magic are you seeing? Um, lots of magic. So, uh... Yeah, I, th I think it's all about having the right uh, data sets uh, and uh, being able to uh, get the most out of your your machine learning algorithms. Uh, so, and revisiting that all the time, as as Anthony was mentioning, like making sure that that you're you're getting most out of it. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. yeah, and most people. Uh, there is as many dams there are as there's also dam providers and systems and technologies to use. There's also different ways of the functionality, you know, the back end stuff of what AI is doing as well. So machines, the learning is happening from algorithms, but the way it work, it actually can be changed here and there. Jill, what are you seeing right now in terms of getting, getting the machines, the, getting those algorithms? That sounds very mathematical, I know, but like, how are they all? Uh, how does that all sort of just become magic? Uh, I can't yes. do the math myself, but I <laughs> but I love the magic that happens afterwards. What are you seeing in your experience? Yeah, so we've um, both of the options Christina um, described we've we've used. So a couple of years ago, when we started our first AI experiment, uh, we went out and found a vendor and used um, you know APIs to pass data back and forth and the current dam that we're using actually has um, AI integrated into the UI which is really handy so I think that um, there are lots of different ways that you can integrate AI into your workflows and it's just again having that dialogue between you know your operations team your data scientists uh, your vendors your engineers um, so yeah I think there's lots of paths that get you to the same goal Mm -hmm. And as we sort of referred to earlier, people process technology, some may could look at this question and say, how do you get AI to work? It's a technological thing. It actually goes back to the people process thing. People working with your damn vendor, uh, what is the AI tools you have? Uh, you know, Jill, you mentioned the great word workflow, huge fan of workflow. Uh, that can be data driven. So let's talk about what those are, but that's a people, that's a process, and that is the technology. And again, I recommend for those of you listening today, 
go start engaging your vendors and talking about some of these things because it's going to be the triumvirate of the three working together to really get the machines working well. Obviously, good data in equals potentially good data out. I can see a flurry of questions here about what happens with AI. We're going to get to those soon. Uh, so be prepared. Those are coming. Uh, okay, so the fun part. Uh, a lot of people, again, science fiction, oh, let's do AI. It sounds kind of fun. But there's so many things that could happen What in terms of what can you do with AI? And I would love for the panelists to start saying, well, what can you do with AI? Uh, Jill, you and I, we were talking earlier about some of the fun things that you're doing with it. Uh, what do you see people doing with AI right now? What kind of stuff do you see? Gosh, well, um, so many things, but off the top of my head, Really, I use it day to day as, as just a tool in, in my work belt to find images for clients. So that's kind of the, the mundane but constant, you know, application of AI. Fun things that, you know, fun projects that we worked on um, a couple years ago for the anniversary of, of Pearl Harbor. Um, we created virtual reality experience of um, constructed from life photos of what it was like, you know, that day. Um, and so surfacing those photographs, we use some tools, uh, AI tools to locate and to do geographical locations. Um, but really, at least for my use case, it's, it's more been about how to um, navigate the intersection of like visual information and textual information. And the AI has done a really good job of helping us bridge, bridge those two silos. So that's kind of where we are. I guess today we had a client who is working on a uh, a marketing campaign and would love historic photos of people playing board games, which has been very difficult for us to find across 10 million photos. And the AI, you know, has been great about even today, just finding photographs of old movie stars playing poker on Hollywood sets. So it's been really fun. I love that example, actually. I would like to see the board games from history too. That's actually quite good. <laughs> Anthony, what are you seeing? You must be seeing uh, some people do some fascinating, you know, uh, you have some great clients. What are they? What are they doing with their AI? So many creative things. I mean, I think to step back, it's important to dimensionalize all the types of AI because I mean, AI has been around actually for quite a long time, whether you call it machine learning or AI, but there's so many dimensions of this. And I think it's important that companies that are really serious about this, look at all the different kinds. So I like to categorize it this way. You've got the quantitative AI, which is things like object recognition, um, the ability to recognize an attribute like a color in an image and then tag it appropriately in your dam. So those are quantitative. There's also qualitative, those things that are more around things like natural language processing, things that are sort of more ephemeral, things that are based on idiosyncrasies of human beings. And then you think about sort of at the other end of it, the other spectrum, I'd say at the top of the maturity curve, if you can adopt this, which is the causal AI types, which is more about predictive sort of helping you understand the purpose of the properties or the, the possibilities of an asset, for example. So sentiment analysis kicks in and these kinds of things. So it's important really when, before you really dig in too deep, while you start with a problem, really understand the spectrum of types and where, because they all work differently. And then the, the way you need to work with them to make them effectively, the different things you need to do to make those pieces successful for you. I was also, awesome. I remember when the, the AI was just being discussed, people were like, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to help me with metadata, AI, you know, image recognition. But there's actually so much more that can happen with AI and machine learning. It's not just those things. It can be actually a lot more. And I can already see some of the questions being uh, queried here, as, uh, with some of the things that they're doing. Hooten, what are you seeing in your experience with uh, some of your clients? And what are they doing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, of course, we have the ones with uh, automatic tagging, image recognition uh, of assets. But what I personally like most is uh, the creative programmatic advertising. Uh, I don't know if you heard about uh, an ad Deutsche Bahn in Germany was running a couple of years back, uh, the no fly, no need to fly campaign. Uh, it's, um, I don't know if everybody knows about Deutsche Bahn, it's a national rail provider in Germany. And uh, the campaigns used an AI to identify German locations that resembled iconic uh, international destinations. 
And uh, then when people were searching for like, uh, I want to travel to London, uh, then the ad would come up on Facebook or Instagram where it would say, find an image uh, that resembled like London Tower Bridge and then say, why fly to London when you can take the train to Munich for 15 euros, for instance. So I really loved what they did with, with all those image recognition and so on, where they created lots of those ads um, on the fly by, by using that image recognition and resemblance a, a algorithm that they had. Uh, we also, we're currently working with a big retailer, helping them with uh, creating personalized um, uh, offers. Uh, for different products and uh, being able to identify where uh, we should place the price on top of the product image automatically based on uh, machine learning and finding out, okay, this is a product within this area, then uh, the price tag should be bottom left because that's uh, where it works best. So things like that. I've seen where good technology has always allowed for good creativity to happen. I think we're definitely seeing that with the advancement of AI uh, in terms of how people can be creative and how they use it. Christina, how have you seen some things happen? You must have some great uh, examples or, or, or thoughts on how AI is being used. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot in the video um, area, right? So of course there's lots going on for images and audio as well for DAM, but um, in video, it's, it's really interesting how it's growing. So of course you, you have um, subject matter recognition in video and it's now time stamped. So you can do searches and just go directly to that clip uh, where the dog is running across the screen. Um, but you can also do things like um, find that moment where your CEO uh, says the company tagline. Um, so it's it's linked to the audio as well, um, or maybe the spot where the CEO like makes the audience laugh, right? And then you can just clip that out. And, um, and with AI, it's smart enough to know how to clip that pretty quickly for you. Um, so you can clip the beginning and end of it off and then go and use that asset um, in your creative production. You can also do some interesting things with um, video clipping in relation to the, or cropping actually, in relation to the focal point. So all of us are watching sports on our phones now. And of course, when you flip from uh, landscape to portrait mode, um, you know, the video either gets smaller or it cuts off the edges. And um, with focal point automated recognition, uh, the video is smart enough or the AI is smart enough to recognize um, where the main action is happening and where the ball is going. So it can actually follow that if you're watching sports. And that's pretty cool as well. Um, and then of course, you know, video uh, transcription, um, so voice to text. And then even translation, I'm seeing quite a lot more of. Um, be careful using AI for translation. That can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, I got myself in quite a bit of trouble doing using Google Translate in Switzerland. Uh, don't do that. Um, but it's a good starter, you know, and, and there's a lot of AI tools out there now that can even help you with um, writing copy and grammar and those sort of things. Hey, I think we, this is we, an exciting time. Oh, go ahead, Anthony. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we do have lo lots of clients actually are using those uh, video transcripts, and uh, we have one one client that's using. Um, they uh, some some of the meetings they need to have transcripts, and before uh, they introduced this AI functionality, somebody had to sit there and write everything down. But now they're just uh, record everything and then um, put it through the, the AI engine and they, they will get all the transcripts in place automatically. I think this is a great time in the industry because we're seeing so many creative uses of AI. Christina, I love those examples. I think this is, for those of you working with brands or even heritage, any sort of industry, there's just the what ifs can actually sort of become 
how do we do it now? It's like you're, they're actually happening. Anthony, were you going to add more? I was just going to layer on and say that, you know, what I'm, what I'm so excited about is watching these companies use the learning capability and the training capabilities to really advance their own intellectual property. So it's, it used to be, well, it's very black box. Now I think companies are really investing in the difference between recognizing their products and their offerings and their brands versus any generic kind of product offering or brand. And so we have companies that get so specific and one of our com com the companies we work with builds planes and helicopters and they've gotten to the point by training these algorithms that ident it identifies the types, not just that it's a helicopter, that it's a type, right? So it's kind of the classic fish tank versus army tank. It's both a tank, but those are very different concepts, right? Of course. But what I love to see is they're developing intellectual property that they can layer onto these engines. And then there are tools out there where once you've built the framework once, you can apply it to multiple AI capabilities. You don't have to go rebuild and retrain another AI engine. You can, if you've done it well, you can basically use the same training you've done in one, one world and apply it to the next. This is, I think, very compelling and it really helps these dam managers take advantage fully of, of the value of these AI capabilities. The opportunities are kind of endless all of a sudden in our world in 2021. Uh, the amount of questions are incredible. This is so exciting. We could have just a whole session on just the questions because uh, they're quite good. Uh, we have two more to go. Um, so let's uh, sort of quickly-ish. Uh, governance, I'm a huge fan of the G word. I think we all need good governance in all that we do. To the panelists, uh, are you seeing things? Uh, in terms of how people are beginning to govern some of this work in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, what are you seeing? Jill, have you seen any usages of, of governance helping, helping this sort of process? Yeah, so I think um, a couple of years ago, kind of going back to uh, you know, what was said about AI being kind of a black box is that you know, at, at that time when we were experimenting, it was a black box. We were getting a lot of auto tagging and it was difficult to sift through some of the noise that we were getting. And you know, with more and more experience, we're actually focusing more on the engine itself and training it um, rather than the kind of black box, put, put something in, get something out. So it's more human in the loop and we're much more hands-on now than we used to be you know, when we first start experimenting. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, I think that basically having conversations and collaborations with the creators of the engines and also as the as the domain experts um, for what it's being trained on, what it's being used for. Putin or Anthony, do you have any sort of feedback on that as you're coming? So, you know, you come from a different point of view on this. How are you seeing governance happen? Um, I, I, I actually I don't think we see enough governance in this area because uh, you know AI uh, degrades over time. And you need to keep your uh, algorithms um, up to date all the time to reflect the changes in the real world. So uh, like new market trends or uh, changes in the different regions of the world. So uh, what's working for your assets in Europe might not be working in, in Asia. So, so for instance, yeah. uh, so, so uh, the training of data is often flawed and uh, can even be biased. So um, yeah, so you, basically you need to have a clear governance plan and, and trans transparency is the key. So uh, you need to make sure that your team knows exactly why your AI made a certain decision because other otherwise it would be uh, impossible. And then in case, um, it's it's not correct then then you know you would know how to change that putin or sorry anthony what are you seeing in terms of are you seeing governance happen sometimes or yeah and i think i think it's kind of strange because when governance is too tight i think you don't decentralize the awareness and understanding and so what we've seen is some of the best ai engines are crowdsourced right so crowdsourcing factors in and people are involved in helping train the AI to be better. So you want to govern it and you want it to be transparent, but you want it to be accessible. So in other words, in the, in the core UI of the dam, it should make the AI tags available, give you the diff on the changes that are happening. So the 
end users of the dam as they're ingesting content and seeing the AI tags come in, they're able to make modifications on the fly, maybe call out that this one is a, is a really good tag because this one really works against the content it just created, but this one was a bit off and make sure that these are intuitive parts of the normal day-to-day -day activities of managing the assets. Because if it's not, you're leaving it to hire a data scientist that sits on it and kind of reviews all the assets every day and hopes they understand. I mean, this is not the right practical way to implement AI. So the dams out there have to be responsible to put this information in front of the users, make it part of the day-to-day -day and um, normalize it. And as that happens, then the government's kind of falls into place if that makes sense, John. Yeah, I love the word normalization. That's a good key concept that everyone should take away from this panel. Uh, Christina, to close it out, how are you feeling on the governance? Uh, yeah. Do you see it happening? Uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure I'm seeing it happening, but I'd like to see it happen. <laughs> um, something interesting I heard somebody say recently is that um, the AI visual recognition tools that we are using in DAM right now have the understanding of about a 10 year old. And I love that idea because if you think about like, imagine a 10 year old running around without governance, like without a parent there to watch out for them. So just think of our AI systems like that. <laughs> and that's all. Let's hope, <laughs> let's hope to see more of that. Okay. We've got a major amount of questions happening here. The voting is happening. There's great ones. Uh, before we get to the Q and A, to each of the panelists, every one of these types of situations love to hear that one piece of advice. Uh, I'm, so I'm just gonna run down from uh, top square to bottom square. What is that one piece of advice that you would give people for starting out? So just a sentence each. Uh, and I'm gonna start uh, top square for me. Uh, Anthony, what is your one piece of advice? Be proactive about people in training. Absolutely. Love the clear and concise. Love it. Hooten, to you, what is your one piece of advice? Uh, make sure you have the right team on board, uh, right tools, and uh, that everyone has the conceptual understanding and uh, the willingness to experiment and iterate. Awesome. Jill, your piece yeah. of advice. Sure. I would say before embarking on your AI journey and your dam, uh, Take a few moments to visualize whether you have a team or alone, what success would look like to you in advance. I love that. Christina, what's your best piece of advice? Yeah, so everybody here has mentioned people in their advice. And if anyone in the questions is asking, can AI reduce my headcount? The answer is no. If anything, you're going to have more data. You need the right team and possibly more people. <laughs> It's like the same. It's like the same argument of the reduction of paper. We now use more paper than ever before, right? I love it. Uh, uh, on behalf of Henry Stewart, I would like to thank uh, each and one of you for bringing your leadership to this discussion. I do think this could go on for about another two hours. Uh, so this is amazing. But we do have a voluminous amount of questions. So Anthony, Hooten, Jill, Christina, thank you so much. The, I'm just going to go right to it. This is getting a lot of votes. So uh, this is also could be its own session in itself. The question from Anonymous. Thank you, Anonymous. Uh, what are your thoughts about overcoming bias in AI implementation with Dan? This is a lot in the news. We see this everywhere. Uh, what do we do about this? Uh, what do we do about bias? Who wants to start? I'll jump in. So when, when I mentioned causal AI, this is really the domain. So there's actually something if you want to go out and research it, it's called causal AI. And causal AI references this bias. There's inherent bias. And, you know, it's a cause and effect issue, right? So you're looking at causal relationship, but you don't look at sort of things that influence the metrics that may not be aligned with the expectation of the result. So I think it's very important that when we look at these practices, that domain expertise, that a, a real, making sure that there's a true understanding of the domain and expertise behind it, because we, if you step back from it and you just let the data do its job and you're using the classic models of machine learning, the result may have these non-intended causal re relationships that, that really don't apply to, to the domain. And we see that time and time again. And that's why active training with domain expertise is critical to make sure those anomalies don't start to be really core 
to everything you're seeing in the results that you're working with. I was on mute. Anyone else want to talk about bias? My apologies. <laughs> Um, I, I would say the most important thing is to, to make sure you have the right data sets and data and uh, the governance. Uh, I read about a search engine uh, which were train that were training a neural network and uh, they sent in 3 million different words from, from a new site and ended up uh, it revealing that it, uh, this neural network had uh, sexist language at the end. So um, yeah, <laughs> you need to make sure what kind of data you put in there. I totally agree with, oh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, with you know every everything that was said, and you know we work with historical photography, and we've certainly run up against this. So I guess a, a few things, you know, who is developing the AI that you are working with? Are they an open organization? Do they have diverse engineers? Um, are they collaborative with you as a user? Sometimes uh, vendors that do do treat their engine as a black box that you can't collaborate on. That's kind of a red flag, I think, sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, basically we're at such an early stage of AI that it's important for everyone to get involved. There's so much to do. There's so much training to be done. There's so many voices that need to be incorporated with how these engines understand the world. As Christina said, you know, they're basically 10 years old. So we all have to kind of be parents. <laughs> And with that comes patience as well, because I think a lot of the expectations are that, oh, it's gonna work, right? Immediately, great. That's not necessarily the case. You know, this is a process, it needs to build. The machines literally need to learn. Because a lot of the feedback I'm seeing here, some of the questions is someone said, RIAI in the dam uh, is completely biased. It identifies every person as Caucasian, regardless of their actual race. How can we explain and correct that? I mean, that's, that's a legitimate and serious issue. Uh, how can that be? You know, that's such a good one, John. I just want to comment. Uh, Glossy is one of our customers, and the difference between facial recognition, which we implement, and complexion, which you know, when you're picking the right makeup or cosmetics, complexion is key. So now we're trying. There's inherent bias where certain things that are subjective, as I said, the qualitative aspects need to be controlled as much as the quantitative, and then how those causal results are there. I think. One thing that we've implemented and really think a lot about is testing. So you don't imagine you need to test your AI engine. I mean, you don't start with this premise that it's broken or not working, but the idea you would test software or test your metadata schema and make sure it's working in your index, that's something we normally do. You need to test your AI engine. So you need to have content that you pre-bake and understand, run it through the system. And if your expected results are biased or what you didn't expect, then with domain expertise, you go in, you tune or walk away from that algorithm. Um, but I would really recommend, you know, when you're thinking about implementing AI, it's not just about connecting it and looking at the results. You should proactively test it. You should have scenarios yeah. that you take, you test them, and then you'll really understand what could the influences in your, your dam or what could take hold. A comment just came in to that. Uh, they said, of course, AI is a never ending journey. But uh, Alex asked, and for the all panelists, how long does it take on average to start seeing concrete results? Can anyone respond to that? It's a tricky one. <laughs> and it also is, it depends, I think. <laughs> It depends on the maturity, I think, of the, the company implementing, or if you've worked with DAM and it's normalized into your, your corporation, you've probably solved a lot of hard metadata problems already. But if you're new and you're starting out and you've got a lot of content to manage and you put it in and it's helping you auto tag and pretty quickly get to a 60, 60, 40 split on, I got, I've got some good automated tagging in here. I think you can get a good head start very quickly. But again, it's not perfect. But I would say, depending on the maturity of the organization, you know, you could be advantaged fairly early, but it is a long game. I would not advise that this should be a short-sighted investment. It's definitely something you got to play the long game on. 
Well, and I think to, to plan that word, this is an investment, which is why we asked the question at the beginning, how does one get started? This is a people process technology initiative. This does take time. Many people, uh, this is an investment from many different ways.